Good morning. Scripture lesson today is taken from the book of Matthew, chapter 18, verses 21 to 35. Let us together pray for illumination. Gracious God, we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth. Make us hungry for this heavenly food, that it may nourish us today in the ways of internal life. Through Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. The servant, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, cancelled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me, and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I cancelled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have, sorry, shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everybody. Last week, we heard Pastor um, speaking about anger and how it kills relationship. Um, that generated a lot of interest or a lot of discussion in my care group or my, my DG. And yeah, I do realize that um, a lot of our anger comes from perceived or comes from hurts that we think mistakes done by others to us, or rather perceived mistakes done by others. Before I go on further, let us commit this time to the Lord. Lord Father, even as I speak this morning, I pray that you will grant each one of us a special understanding of your word shared today. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable to you our rock and redeemer. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, what, we read, what, we, what was just read by Sister Dina is actually the parable of the unforgiving servant. It is actually a very simple and to us, to many of us, a familiar story. It is about a king who, re, who what you call, who forgave his servant, and, but in return, his servant refuses to forgive his fellow servant. The king got angry, cancelled the forgiveness, or rather withdrew, withdrew the forgiveness, and the servant had to repay his debt. To bring it to current times, I've actually downloaded a modern-day video of what this parable is. Shall we just have a look at the video first?
I've got an appointment with Mr. Wood. I have your six o'clock here, Mr. Wood. Mr. Wood will see you now. Thank you. Take a seat, Mr. Martell. Do you know why you're here? Yes, sir. I've been studying your accounts for the last two years, and uh, you have managed to collect an overwhelming amount of debt, $2.3 billion, and not a single effort has been made to make payment. I've contacted the company lawyer. The trial will take place in three weeks, and you have until then to make payment in full. But, sir, how can I ever come up with that much money? Failure to repay the debt will result in a lifetime prison sentence, and the debt will be passed on to your immediate family. My family has nothing to do with this. Your mistakes affect more than just yourself. Please, sir, be patient with me, and I will pay back everything. Tony, you can never repay that debt. That's why I've decided to cancel it in full. I don't deserve that. No, but go and forgive as you've been forgiven. Don't work yourself too hard, Adam. You know me, sir. I never do. <laughs> Tony? You haven't paid rent, Adam. It's been over a month. I left you a note the other day explaining my situation. <sighs> Don't give me that excuse. Pay back what you owe me every last penny. I get paid next week. Please, be patient with me. I'll pay back everything I owe. That's not good enough. Here's your eviction notice. You must pack your things and leave by tomorrow morning. Did Adam take leave? Well, not exactly. He called to report he'd been evicted. Why didn't he show up for work? I'm not sure. All I know is that he missed his payments and Tony Martell told him to be out of the company apartment by morning. Send Tony in when he gets here. Morning, sir. I canceled all of that debt of yours. $2.3 billion. But you've got the nerve to evict a man from his apartment for not paying his rent for one month? I can explain. I've decided to reinstate all of your debt. Every last penny. There's a modern day rendition of the parable of the forgiving servant. The video ends with the statement, forgive as you are forgiven. What does this mean? Forgive and as you are forgiven. The author C.S. Lewis once observed that forgiveness is a beautiful word until you have something to forgive. 
We all know the importance of forgiveness. The, the, fact is that the, what, the fact is that few other parables of Jesus have such strong consequences. If you don't forgive, God will not forgive you. Our very basis of salvation depends on forgiveness. So it is extremely important for forgiveness. But when confronted with forgiveness, many of us face difficulties. We sometimes avoid it. We actually postpone it. Let ourselves, we say we want to cool down first. But, but ultimately, it is some of us or many of us, me included, sometimes find forgiveness difficult. Why? This is maybe perhaps it is our understanding of forgiveness what it means by forgiveness. So this morning, let us examine the parable, the parable about forgiveness, and see what we can learn from this parable. The first point, we all have heard the famous verse, or rather the famous phrase, phrase, sorry, phrase, forgive and forget. That's one of the most famous English verses, sorry, English phrases, so where did, does this idea come from? When we forgive, we must forget. Did it come from the Bible? Let's look at the parable of Matthew. Let's look, look at the parable, Matthew 8.21. What does it say? Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. So how do we forgive a person 77 times if we have to forget the very first time? Worse still, some Bible translation says we have to forgive 70 times 7. That is 490 times. So how do we do that? If we have to forgive and forget, and if we have to forget the very first time, then how do we forgive 77 times or 490 times? Each, that is because each time we recall, we for, each time we recall, we forgive. You've got to remember that forgiving, for, forgetting is not forgiving. So where does this Bible, sorry, where does this verse come from? Forgive and forget. The phrase, the phrase actually comes from Shakespeare, William Shakespeare, in a play, King Lear. For those of us who did, that did literature, English literature, you will know King Lear. But for the modern one, it's not Princess Leia from a galaxy far, far away. It's King Lear, 400 years ago. The actual word used was forget and forgive. Which brings us to the first point. Forgiving does not mean forgetting. For in psychology, a very effective method of persuasion is actually repetition. One of the easiest and most powerful methods of persuasion is actually repetition. It is used everywhere. Advertisement, indoctrination, you repeat and repeat and repeat. Eventually, a lie can become the truth. And that's what has happened to forgive and forget. For more than 400 years, we have been repeating this phrase. Then it becomes true. What are the other examples of phrases Phrases, sorry, I keep using, this word keeps slipping my lip. F phrases. <laughs> what other examples of phrases of William Shakespeare that we have come to accept as gospel truth or near gospel truth? Anybody? Have you heard? Love is blind. Where is it from? Merchant of Venice. What other phrase? Anybody here? All that glitter is not gold. Same, Merchant of Venice. So you got it? It is not from the Bible. 
if we equate forgiving to forgetting, every time we remember, we think that we have failed because we have not forgotten. And that's what the devil wants us to do. You think you have failed and then you give up. You don't forgive anymore. But the parable asks us, you must forgive 77 times or even 70 times 7 times. Meaning that whenever you recall, each time you recall, you forgive again and again. Let us do a test. The more you, for, the more you try to forget, actually, the more you will remember. Serious. Okay, let's do a test. I ask you, try to forget. Try to forget what you have for breakfast. What is the first thing you do? You re try to recall what you actually have for breakfast. Or maybe I ask you, try to forget where you parked your car this morning. What happens? The first thing that comes to mind, hey, where's my car? You recall. So each time you... So each time you recall, it is not, you have the illusion that you are not forgetting. But sorry, you, you have the illusion that you are not forgiving. But actually, each time you recall, you forgive again and again. Before your anger starts, you decide you have already forgiven. Therefore, you will not then let the devil gain a foothold. That's from Ephesians 4.27. Forgiveness is not about forgetting. Forgiveness is releasing the offender from the need to pay. To help you remember, I have made a drawing to show how this conflict of forgiveness or for, and for, forgiving and forgi forgetting can be. How conflicted it can be. If you look if you look at the, at the picture, you'll see that I've drawn forget is a bad substitute for forgive. Why? Let's take away the four. And what do you get? Get is a bad substitute for give. Of course it's a bad substitute. Get is the opposite of give. You get is dapat. You give is bury. It's actually the exact opposite. And because we try to merge two opposite concepts together, we find it difficult to forget and we think that we have not forgiven. So ultimately, forget is to release and not to forget. Look at our parable again. In verse 32 to 34, it says, The master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said, I cancel all your debts, and I, I cancel all that debts of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. Do you think the master has forgotten the debt? If he has forgotten the debt, he will not have been able to restore. The debt is not forgiven. It was released and then restored. So that brings me to my next point. What then is the reason for we to forgive? What did Jesus say was the main reason for forgiveness? In our parable, he says, Our Heavenly Father will treat us like the servant, unless we forgive from our heart. Matthew 6.14 says, If you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Colossians 3.13 says, Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And our Lord's prayer Give us, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. You will notice that each time God asks us to forgive, He also mentions His own forgiveness. Christian forgiveness is always linked to God. 
because forgiveness restores our relationship with God. But we always think that forgiveness should restore our relationship also to men, to our fellow men. This is an expectation. And because we expect this restoration, relationship with men, we sometimes put conditions on our forgiveness. We find that forgiveness is especially easy when someone says sorry, someone repents, or someone show remorse. Last week, in pastor's sermon, we were shown a video about saying sorry. Remember the girl in the supermarket? How difficult it was for another lady to say sorry? But that was directed at the wrongdoer. We are always taught, we were always taught that if we make a mistake, we say sorry. But somehow, this idea got reversed that we end up thinking that if the other person does not say sorry, we don't have to forgive. Why? Because we focus on the offence and the person and not God. But God is actually the reason for our forgiveness. We have a misconception that forgiveness will lead to renewed friendship between the victim and the offender. We expect our relationship with one another to be restored. Yes, ideally that is the case. But that is not the reason that we forgive. It is a bonus if our relationship is restored. While hanging on the cross, Jesus forgave his enemies. He said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. What did his enemy do? What did the guards do? They took his clothes they divided it among themselves. They spit on him. They mocked on him. Did they repent? Did they show remorse? Did they regret? No, they didn't. But yet, Jesus asked that their sins be forgiven. When we bear a grudge, unconsciously, we are actually wishing harm on another person. We wish that the person will get hurt. And that actually breaks our relationship with God. Our relationship with God is actually broken because we wish harm on another person. In the Old Testament, even in the Old Testament, pre-Jesus forgiveness time, in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, says, Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your, your people but love your neighbour as yourself. I am the Lord. Interesting. Even in the Old Testament, God asked His people not to seek revenge and He reminds His people that He is the Lord. This is because that is the reason for the forgiveness. He is the Lord. It is a commandment. Not another people's apology or sorry. It is important to remember that forgiving someone and recon reconciliation is not synonymous. We can forgive, but sometimes the other person does not wish to reconcile. Worse still, they think they are not wrong. Romans 12, 17 says, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you. Hebrews 12.14 has the same message. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone. Make every effort. In, in other words, God is asking us, do not take revenge. Do not seek revenge. Do not bear a grudge. Do not repay evil for evil. But because reconciliation depends on two people, two parties, He's, God says, as far as it depends on us, as if it is possible. The, 
He commands us to forgive, but He asks us to try our best to live in peace with everyone. The focus of God's forgive, the focus of forgiveness is on God, not sin, not man. Next, we have a problem when we 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 would we would have a problem because we were asked. Now, if we forgive and we give in, is that, is that not condoning the sin? Do you think it's condoning the sin? By forgiving, are we agreeing to the sin? Let us, let us go back to our parable. When we look at our parable, we know that people get angry. A few people got angry. Who got angry? The king. The king got angry because his servant refuses to forgive his fellow servant. Who else? The servant. He got angry because his fellow servant was unable to pay his debt. Who else? There's this little other person. This person called the other servants. Matthew 18.31 Let's have a look. When the other servants saw what happened, they were outraged, angry, and went and, and, went and told their master everything that has happened. Now, we, always, we often miss this other person, this other servant. We can see that they too got angry. This is, this is what pastor would call last week maybe righteous anger. Did they condone the sin? Did they keep quiet? Of course not. They told the master. Did they take things into their own hands? Did they seek revenge? Of course, they are the other servants. Plural. They could have beaten up this servant. Or maybe they could have just ostracized this servant. But they did not. They just reported it to the master. So when Christ, as Christians, when we see something wrong and keeping silent is not forgiving. It does not equate to forgiving. Especially when other people are suffering. You forgive when you alone are suffering. But when we see some other people suffering and you get angry, you don't go and forgive and say that I forgive that person who sinned against you. It's like, Watching, it's like when you see someone breaking into your neighbor's house. What do you do? You keep quiet, and when your neighbor comes back, you say, oh, don't worry, I've forgiven the thief. That doesn't work, is it? does it? So forgiveness is not condoning a sin. It, in fact, in these circumstances, failure to act would be condoning the sin. Try to teach, trying to teach another party a personal lesson is actually just playing God. Finally, some may ask, if we forgive sins, won't we be taken advantage of? Won't we be exploited? People will start demanding that we forgive their sins start demanding that we don't collect our debts. That's the next point of our parable. Sorry, that's the next point. Let's see what our parable say. We look at the parable for our guidance and it says in, in Matthew chapter 18, when the servants, two, it occurs two occasions. One is the servant that refuses to forgive and the other one is the servant the fellow servant. Did the servants, when they were unable to pay, ask for their debts to be forgiven? They didn't ask for their debts to be forgiven. They said on both occasions, be patient with me and I will pay it back. They asked for more time. Debt is significant. When we owe money, we pay back. 
you cannot demand the other party to forgive. It is the other party who forgives. It's God that asks the other party to forgive, not you asking the other party to forgive. If you are able to pay your debt, you must pay your debt. Don't take advantage of another person. We look at Romans chapter 13, verse 7 to 8. What does it say? Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honour, then honour. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another for whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. If you have the ability to settle, then you must repay your debt. Proverbs 3, 27 to 28 says, Do not withhold good from those whom it is due. When it is, when it is, in, your power, when it is in your power to act, do not say to your neighbour, come back tomorrow and I'll give it to you when, it is already, when you already have it with you. You see, when you have it with you, when you, it, is, it is within your ability, you must repay your debt. It is saying that we cannot withhold payment when we must, we cannot withhold payment when we are able when it is within our ability to do. Don't go around taking advantage of another. But on the reverse, if someone owes you money or owes or hurts you, you are to forgive. This is what, just as God forgives you. This is God asking, never the debtor. Asking, especially when they are able to settle. It is a right of God, not of man, to demand this forgiveness. So if a person actually demands, make such a demand to you, report him, I would say. But forgive him. If he cannot repay, forgive him. But if you think it is likely that others will suffer the same fate, then others, then others will be affected. Report him. The standards are high. Luke 17.4 says, Even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive. That's the standard of God. If someone keeps making the same mistake seven times a day and seven times a day come and tell you, sorry, you forgive. Forgiveness is difficult when we focus on the sin and the sinner. It is easy when you focus on God, His forgiveness and His command. Now, having said that, if you still think that it is hard to forgive, then maybe this will help you. Forgiveness has health benefits. Yes, to you, the forgiver. John Hopkins Medical School have found that the act of forgiveness can reap huge rewards for your health. It lowers heart attack, improves cholesterol level and sleep, reducing pain, blood pressure, anxiety and depression. A re the research points to an increase in forgiveness health connection as you age, means the older you get, the more benefits you get by forgiving. So if you forgive, you'll be a healthy person, free of charge. Let me end today's message with the story about a boy. There was a little boy sitting in a park on a bench. He was moaning and groaning in pain. So a man passed by and asked him, why are you moaning and groaning? The boy said, I am sitting on a bumblebee. So the man asked, then why don't you get up? The boy said, I won't. Because I figure that I'm hurting him more than he is hurting me. That's, That's unforgiveness. So today, if you think that you want someone to get hurt, or you're thinking of hurting someone, God asks you, 
to forgive. Let us pray. Lord Father, we pray, Lord Father, that even as we obey your command, even as we attempt to obey your command, you will search our hearts, soften our hearts, that even as we, yeah, even as we forgive one another, that you will, we will find comfort and peace in obeying your word. We pray all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.